Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Thank you so much for spending time with us. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, punk lives on. Local icons of the movement are immortalized as they age. Also on the show, neighbors helping neighbors after the devastating floods. But first, supporting our local farmers through our love of their food. Well, the heart of the Fraser Valley has been hit so hard by floods. The region supplies 50% of the dairy and eggs consumed in the entire province and, and the closed roads are going to make it more difficult for all farms in the valley to get their goods to market. So, how do we support our local producers? Angie Qualley owns Well Seasoned Gourmet in Langley and she is a champion of buying local. Angie, hello there. Hi, Gloria. Good to see you. Well, it's so good to see you, too. There's something just kind of comforting about touching base right now. <laughs> well, what, what has this past week or so been like for you since the floods? Uh, well, it's been pretty interesting out here for sure. I mean, I live in Langley and my uh, the main part of my business is in Langley, but I uh, our commissary catering kitchen is in Abbotsford and we were evacuated last Monday when the storm started. Uh, so our kitchen, uh, we weren't allowed back in until Friday. So thankfully, we were allowed back in the kitchen on Friday. And fortunately, where my kitchen is, we were actually on a bit of a high spot. So we didn't sustain any damage to the kitchen other than a lack of access, which, I mean, thank God for that. We definitely uh, feel really lucky that we are in a, a on a high spot because we are on the Sumas Prairie. We're right on Sumas Road. Um, so it could have been, you know, literally if we'd been, you know, 200 meters east of where we are, we would have had, you know, catastrophic losses. So it's been really hard to um, to watch our friends and neighbors out in Abbotsford deal with all of this. And certainly our, our farming community is paying a really high price for this right now. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. There's so many sad stories out there and so much loss. And what are you hearing from, you know, farmers and, and food producers? What are they saying about the, the future of the region as more of these climate events are expected? I mean, farmers are resilient, Gloria. You know that better, you know. I mean, they are the, the land. They, they This is what they do. They deal with weather and nature and the land and um, so they will, you know, forge through and, and figure out a way to make make it work. All of this. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I haven't spoken. I, I haven't spoken to many of them personally. I've had a couple of conversations, but they're busy. They're really busy and they don't have time for chit chat. They're tr trying to save their animals, trying to clean up their safe and um, trying to figure out what they've lost and how they start back up again. Some of them I've heard. Um, you know, so a couple of poultry farmers had catastrophic losses and there's no, there's no baby chicks to replace those stocks. So they're going to be months and months and months before they can replace their flock. Um, so I think that we have a long road ahead of us and uh, it's, it's been really hard to watch for sure. No kidding. Now, I know you have always been such a supporter of, you know, Shop Local and uh, the farm tour in the Valley as well. So how can people help support farmers right now, whether they're impacted by the floods directly or just, you know, helping to get their goods to market? I mean, I, I'm not sure there's a specific way currently to help the farmers like directly right now. I mean, they're all just, they've got, got their heads down and they're trying to recover from what's happening. And truthfully, they're still breaking themselves for what could happen this weekend uh, with this next storm front coming through. So the best way I think to support our local farmers is to shop local, to shop in Canada. Um, you know, I was really disappointed that uh, the government has, has directed people to shop in the U.S. for dairy and, and gas um, when they are also telling us that there's no problems with the supply chain here. Um, I think the best way you can support it any of our local producers is to buy local. The local product ends up in your local restaurants. It ends up in your local grocery store. So buy Canadian. And if you can't get something today, just be patient with the farmers and it'll be back in stock in a day or two. Um, 
they're they're really doing the best they can and, and the best way to support anybody right now is to shop local and shop Canadian. I like underscoring that message for sure. Now, uh, mm -hmm. are you already uh, are you already getting into the mood for the season now? Doing any baking mm -hmm. yourself? Yeah, well, our kitchen's full tilt right now. Uh, all of our culinary team, our pastry chef, our chefs, they're all working really hard getting ready for the holidays. And people are starting to get into the Christmas spirit a little bit, I guess. So, um, you know, we've got, you know, shortbread on the go. So we're making lots and lots of different kinds of shortbread here. We created this um, pink peppercorn shortbread. It's uh, super unexpected and really delicious, and you can buy it in our gourmet to go freezer. You just thaw it and bake it yourself. So if you don't have time to do any of your own baking, you can pop in here and pick some of that up. Um, yeah, there's so much fun stuff. I mean, the supply chain has been uh, slowed down and interrupted to some extent, but uh, stock is still rolling in. It's just rolling a little bit slow. So um, yeah, it's going to be a fun holiday season, oh. I, I hope. Pink peppercorn shortbread. I love the sound of that. But um, what about some other, you know, little items that that people could uh, go to for some some gift ideas? Uh, well, right now we just received our shipment of um, popcorn advent calendars. <laughs> so these are um, these are from the U.S. It's a company called uh, Wabash Farm. It's a family-owned um, popcorn company. Uh, and there's 24 days of snacking, so you can pop in and pick up that. Uh, we've also got lots of really great Canadian-made products that are delicious for entertaining or stocking stuffers. Um, one of my favorite things right now is this um, company out of the Okanagan. It's called Gourds Honey Heat. And um, this this product is uh, local honey, so it's, uh, BC honey, and it's infused with lots of different things. This one is honey and chili pepper, so it's like a spicy honey. And... Um, we've been putting this on so many things at my house uh, the last few days. I've been adding it into my vinaigrette instead of maple syrup. Um, so there's tons of fun things like that. And we also received our um, shipment of um, handcrafted fruitcake. So this is made um, by a woman in Saskatchewan in Swift Current. She candies all of her own fruit. Uh, it takes her months and months to make these beautiful fruitcakes, and she sends them out to us from Saskatchewan. So thankfully, we received road closed and uh, transport our shipments were interrupted so we've got tons of delicious things and lots of fun gifts and uh, stocking stuffers that sounds amazing now yeah our signal hasn't been all that smooth you've cut out a little bit during our conversation but i did get all of the products you were were holding up and uh and promoting and we wish you all the best of the season angie take good care thank you gloria you too um maybe we'll see you again before christmas take care Hi, I'm Nashir. I'm Freda. This is our Vancouver. All right, let's take time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase a number of the photographs that are sent in by you. First, Bikram Rajal was out for a walk in foggy Kensington Park in Burnaby. An image of the season for sure. Bikram, thank you very much. And Leland Soriano took in this splendid moon ring from her home in Chilliwack. Oh, the sky these days has been giving us so many delights. Thank you. And finally, Aishwarya Kapoor took in a stunning sunset recently. The colors are just outstanding. Thanks very much for sharing that. And do send us more. It's easy. Just send your favorite shots to us at bcphotos at cbc.ca. bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, amid the devastating flooding, another tide is rising. The spirit of empathy and cooperation is growing by the day with neighbor helping neighbor, everything from food to fresh water to a place to stay. Well, Nick Purden shows us how closely people are pulling together. In the whole time I've lived here, I've never seen anything like this. Ellen Friesen has been watching the water for days. Out there, submerged is the Sumas Prairie on the eastern edge of Abbotsford. The fact that we can see it unfold in front of us, out our window, that was, that was crazy. So many of our friends live on the Sumas Prairie. That's where we attend church, that's our community there, and that's who I was, that's who I was worried about. People like Erica McCauley. Erica's home 
is out there in what state she doesn't really know. As the water rose higher and higher, she and her husband, along with their three kids, were forced to abandon it. And at that point, um, we knew we had about 15 to 30 minutes to pack and go. Um, by the time we left, things were starting to rise faster, that, like we couldn't turn around. I just wanted to get the kids in the vehicle and get out. I was more frightened than I thought I would be. What were you frightened of? If you have children, everyone's worried about that you'll lose your children. That night, Erica and her family slept on the floor of a McDonald's in a strip mall, completely surrounded by water. Okay. The next day when they were finally rescued, Ellen opened her doors to them. I was just thrilled that we got them here, um, but they walked in with a backpack. I mean, and I realized that that's all they had time for. I can cook for them, I can support them, and that I'm so glad we can do that. Do you know where our house is? Yeah. Yeah, straight Way ahead. Way out there. As a human being, if you have a heart, how could you not? I feel that this is the least I can do. Erica tells me she doesn't know what she would have done if Ellen hadn't helped her. This is the help we need. Mostly it just, it gives us a space to actually breathe and think things through. We've seen an incredible amount of people with huge heart. And I want our community to remain um, a united community that understands what it means to suffer together. And that's the sense you get all over Abbotsford. That in a way, everyone has been affected by the floods. Take Jeff London and his friends. Their houses are safe and dry, but they're still here filling bags with sand. Do we work all day out in Surrey? And yeah. just down here helping out today. So you finished your regular job. Yeah. And then you came here to help out. Yeah. How come? People need it. Yeah, why not? One day maybe somebody will do it for me. And that's the thing. When a disaster strikes, we all wonder when it might hit us. Dean Reinprecht tells me that when the flood came, he had to do something. And now he's been here so long, he can barely lift his arms. It's been quite emotional, just people kind of driving by. And, and, and a, a lady came by earlier and dropped off like 15 bags of lunch she made at home by herself. And like just that alone just gets you so pumped. What does it do for you to help? It just feels way worse sitting at home and thinking that there was something I could have done. What it does for me is, um, yeah, all I can say is I'm just grateful. Yeah, it just makes me feel grateful to get the opportunity to help. Yeah. An opportunity to help is what everybody seems to want. Take a look at this place. It's nonstop, people bringing supplies to help those affected by the floods. How about pasta sauce? Alicia McCallum is the organizer. Somewhere? You see this room fill up and get emptied out into uh, trucks to go deliver to people and then within minutes filled up again. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. You're smiling in the middle of a disaster. Oh, it, because of this. This has brought so much hope. Um, and just to see a community rally together when there's such a need, um, it brings, yeah, it, it brings a smile to my face to see how much people care about other people. Belle Thielman tells me she couldn't imagine being anywhere else today. My kids ditched school today to come here because I think it's just really important for, um, I want to raise them to help people in the community instead of um, just worrying about themselves all the time. It's really important to me. I got to package a bunch of food for people and I learned that it's like better to give to people than to receive. I think I'll remember this day for years to come. For Felix's mom, being here is about more than food and supplies. For her, the town is sending a message to those who need help. It's gonna show them that they do have people behind them, even though they may feel alone, that they've lost everything, that there are people here that care for them and just want, want the best for them, wanna help them. The flood brought destruction and despair here, but it also brought out the reality that to make it past all that, people have to fight together. Seeing the sun today uh, is hopeful. It's like, oh, okay, this is a break, this is good. I hope that when this is finished, I hope that as a community, as a city, that we won't forget this, that we will be more empathetic, that we will be kind people after this. Even when the water is gone, like I hope that we will 
we will remember. Nick Purden, CBC News, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Coming up, Johanna Wagstaff explains the weather phenomenon we know all too well. It's the atmospheric river. Atmospheric rivers are literal rivers in the sky. These narrow conveyor belts transport huge amounts of water vapor from the equator northward. They're often only a few hundred kilometers wide, but can stretch thousands of kilometers long. And when they make landfall, they can bring intense rainfall in a short amount of time, rising snow levels and strong winds. As this column of air hits the mountains on the west coast, the downpours can lead to flooding, power outages and landslides. For BC, they are quite common in the fall and the winter, but climate change has already meant the intensity of these events has increased. And as the climate continues to warm and the atmosphere can hold more moisture, climate projections have shown a nearly four-fold increase in atmospheric rivers hitting Western North America by the end of the 21st century. And now you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Johanna, thank you very much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, in the 70s, the anarchist counterculture movement known as punk rock was born. And Vancouver and Victoria were really epicenters for the music and the activism. And that lasted for decades. And photographer Dina Goldstein has been there to chronicle the key figures of punk rock. And her exhibit, OG Punk, is on now at the Polygon Gallery. Dina, hello there. Hi, Gloria. And also with us today, Helga Pakasar. She is Polygon's curator. Helga, hello. Hello, Gloria. Okay, so Dina, why did you want to focus your lens on the, on the punk rock icons of our region? Well, these are ailing and aging original punk rockers. Uh, many of them are local musicians and artists and punk devotees. And really, uh, a lot of them are dying down, uh, dying, dying and uh, ailing. And uh, I wanted to get them before I lost the opportunity, like I did with um, with a Chai Pig, who uh, is uh, Ken Chin, who passed away a couple of years ago uh, during the pandemic. And I, he's really truly iconic, and I wasn't able to capture him. Unfortunately. Okay. okay, well, that is unfortunate, but this uh, exhibition is on right now. And Helga, when, when Dina talks about this opportunity, what kind of opportunity did this present for Polygon? Well, first of all, it's an opportunity to show Dina Goldstein and her uh, photojournalist approach to subjects in our milieu here, which she's been um, active in for many decades. So mm -hmm. that's a great opportunity. But it also uh, is uh, something, uh, this kind of show uh, is typical of what the Polygon has been doing for years. Uh, we have a long-standing interest in bringing to light uh, aspects of local histories, uh, often histories that are not so well known. We've uh, discovered a lot of uh, photographs that hadn't been previously seen. So we love to work with documentary photography as a powerful tool for offering clues in uh, to our lives. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. Um, so let's take, take us into this punk rock world now. Dina, who are some of the characters that you met? Well, I first met Mad Dog, uh, and he lives beside my studio, and uh, I had been working on my um, archive, my 30-year archive and book, for a year and a half during the pandemic, so I was pretty much isolated, and I really wanted to pick up my camera again. So when I met him, he told me all these wonderful stories about the early 80s and the punk rock scene here in Vancouver, and he offered to introduce me to some key figures. So uh, basically, he introduced me to Raw Punk, Miles Pedersen, Wendy Thirteen, who's been booking um, and promoting punk rock bands here for decades. Uh, and by this time, everybody was vaxxed, and it was safe enough to come back into the studio. Uh, so I started this impromptu series 
Um, and uh, one led to the other. Wendy connected me with the Victoria crowd, uh, the Dayglo abortions. So I rented a studio there and uh, photographed them all. They all came and had their uh, a reunion. It was a good time for everybody. Well, it sounds like it was you. So you, you hit into a really interesting part of, of BC history here, too. And so as you're doing the photo sessions, you asked them to give you kind of a, a favorite memory. What, what came to the forefront? Well, I, they all had so many, so many memories, like too much even to remember. And I can't even re uh, believe that they remember after all the partying that they uh, they took part in. Uh, Miles Pedersen talks about his band, Unnatural si Silence, opening up for Black Flag. Rob Punk remembers the last Ramon show. Doug Donut uh, of Death Sentence uh, has, has daily dangerous adventures to... Um, to remember, and uh, Wendy talks about booking the band The Exploited for her birthday at the Cobalt. Um, one more, Billy Hopeless and his band The Black Halos, they opened up uh, for CBGBs and introduced DOA at the Smiling Buddha. Uh, and he recalls when a mother told him that his music stopped her daughter from committing suicide. And they all remember um, the plaza, which was the Pong Hangout uh, DOA headquarter, and the Smiling B uh, Buddha, which was uh, the venue. Yeah, and so what do you okay. think, D Dina, what do you think it says about, about the, the punk movement, and I guess, and, and our city, you know, we're talking Vancouver, Victoria, that, that so many of these uh, originals, that they're, they're staying true to their roots. Yes, absolutely. And one of the questions I ask is, uh, punk here to stay? And of course, they all say, yes, it never left. It's here to stay. And it's uh, obviously a way of life uh, based on the principles of punk, uh, nonconformity, anti-authoritism, anti-corporatism, uh, DIY um, ethic, anti-commercialism. And of course, punk music is central to the whole movement. Sure. Okay. So punk is here to stay. And Helga, what about the OG punk exhibit? Um, how long is that going to be up for? Uh, that will be up until January 3rd. And we will also be having uh, some events uh, that this exhibition generates that you can find out about at the Polygon website. Okay. Helga, Dina, thank you very much. All the best. Enjoy. to go and see some live music. Vancouver's beloved indie band Mother Mother plays a series of five shows at the Commodore from December 2nd to the 5th. Filipino Canadian from Toronto rapper named Killy comes back to our city for the first time since the pandemic. He plays Venue December 11th. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music here to share with you the latest news from the Canadian Music Class Challenge 2021. That's when we challenge music teachers and students to learn and perform a song from our list and then send in the video for a chance to win great prizes. The registration and submission period for the contest just closed this past week, and I'll get to that in a minute. But first, here's some of the videos that we've already posted to YouTube. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. We are seeing the truth of the world. We are marching to the beat of
Amazing, did you recognize that one? There you go. That's an early sampling of some of the videos we've received for this year's Canadian Music Class Challenge 2021. Students there taking on Everybody's Working for the Weekend by Loverboy, Sandwiches by Fred Penner, and One Drum by Leela Gilday. All schools from Alberta, interestingly enough. And right now we're in the process of uploading hundreds of videos from coast to coast to coast to this CBC Music Class YouTube channel. That's where you can check out all of the submissions from every province and territory from this year's Canadian Music Class Challenge. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. Good luck to all the music classes participating, and I'll update you again soon on the classes that have made it to the national top tens. Coming up, Indigenous communities hardest hit by the floods question the warning system. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, some of the hardest hit communities during this disaster are Indigenous. And while governments have long promised equal treatment of First Nations, Wamish Hamilton is hearing from many who say they've been left to sink or swim on their own. As dawn broke on Monday and flood waters surged, BC emergency officials quickly coordinated with municipalities to respond to one of the worst disasters on record. But Coldwater Indian Band Chief Lee Spahan was left scrambling. No, we never received no call. The flood overwhelmed band offices in downtown Merritt. Inklopamuk land was evacuated. Spahan is still searching for help. We feel like, uh, yes, we're being ignored and we're just being pushed aside. We're not getting the proper consultation from the city of Merritt. Coldwater isn't alone. Cooks Ferry Indian Band Chief Christine Minabariot was forced to go door to door to warn her members. I've got people evacuated since Monday with no support from ESS yet. We're not getting any services to us anytime soon. Dozens of other First Nations are dealing with this disaster. Some, like Nuweich and Nikomen, are still completely cut off by destroyed bridges and roads. This crisis was well underway when the BC government turned to the First Nation Emergency Support Society to help coordinate aid. We were probably called the next day after the original first aid to, to uh, get involved in the emergency, which I think was a little late. The provincial government says they engaged the First Nation's emergency support services from the start and that they called municipalities and First Nations with information and updates. In a lengthy response, Indigenous Services Canada stated, First Nations governments and Emergency Management BC play a lead role in assessing the immediate needs of First Nation community members on reserve. But, they say, the department will reimburse First Nations for eligible response and recovery costs. Indigenous leaders say that kind of jurisdictional confusion, bureaucracy, and funding battles remain the main problem. Chief Spahan has requested $70,000 in immediate emergency aid. So far, the cold water ban has received $300. Wamish Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Transport Canada is now prohibiting non-essential marine vessels in certain flooded areas of BC. But all last week, citizens with access to boats have been stepping up to help stranded people and those in need of supplies. Videographer Gianpaolo Mendoza caught up with a river guide about what it's been like on the water. Hi there, uh, I'm Landon Gill. I'm part of the uh, Fraser Valley Angling Guides Association. And we are out here just trying to volunteer our time, trying to get people to and from where they need to be, essential cancer treatment patients and anyone that is stuck and stranded and needs to get home for their safety. I've given probably about 15 to 20 people rides and then there's been so many boats doing it, like we've probably given at least 200 plus people rides and rescue missions for sure. 
we picked up a lot of people from Hope there and they were so happy and relieved. A lot of people were in tears just to get home, you know, little kids. There was a couple 10 and 12 year old that their parents were in Chilliwack and they were stuck in Hope without their parents. You know, people are just relieved and happy to see their family again and in a time of uncertainty and it's just really good to be able to help out. How would I get there if it wasn't for people like Landon and his guiding company getting me there? I would miss my appointments and it's vital that I get there. Okay, okay. see you Wendy. See ya. We're just out here trying to help people. We're just trying to get people home and get people safe. Hello, my name is Eugene and here is our Vancouver. An unexpected announcement this week from India's Prime Minister. Narendra Modi reversed the controversial farm laws at the centre of global protests. And that opposition was felt right here in BC, especially with the Punjabi community. As Benit Braich reports, farmers are rejoicing, but they're tempering their celebrations with cautious optimism. Celebrations taking place in this province and around the world. In BC, this blueberry farmer is one of many supporting those in India and now feeling the relief. We are feel very good. We are going to so many rallies and everybody is happy, you know. Kunar has farmed in Abbotsford for 35 years with personal connections and property back home in India. My friends and relatives called congratulating. From here, from India, everybody's happy. All these farmers sacrificed their lives, protesting in sun, rain, finding shade. The efforts of farmers cultivating a victory, he says. Celebrating along with the farmers is this American cardiologist who has been just outside Delhi for a year, helping treat more than 100,000 protesters. When I heard the news about this, I literally couldn't stop crying. It literally feels like there was a noose uh, around the necks of the farmers and we were able to remove that noose. Something that took too long to happen with more than 700 farmers dying during the protests in India, he says. And all the human rights violations that we suffered through, and I think it finally, it ended. For a year, the Indian government has defended its laws, saying that they were necessary to modernize the country's agriculture sector and boost private investment. But farmers protested, saying that they were a threat to their livelihood, forcing them to sell their crops at a price too low. But with all the joy, some warn it's still important to be critical as the announcement comes before key elections next year. And the government must still repeal the laws, a process not expected to start until December. There are still other outstanding issues that the farmers want discussed. He says volunteers from Khalsa Aid will continue to stand with the farmers until they return to their land. Many of these farmers who've been out protesting can see, you know, light at the end of this tunnel that they will be able to have um, dignity in their farming. Others here in BC remain optimistic, sharing the news and reveling in the celebration. Benit Braich, CBC News, Abbotsford. Coming up, women left the workforce in large numbers when the pandemic hit. We look at what would bring them back. Welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, since the start of the pandemic, tens of thousands of women have left the Canadian workforce. And in some cases, burnt out from overwork, maybe feeling squeezed by a lack of support. Well, as Michelle Gossoub reports, experts say it is key to understand why women are leaving and whether they'll come back. 
By now, you've probably heard of the Great Resignation. Thousands of workers are leaving their jobs as the pandemic stretches into a second year. But here in Canada, far more women are leaving the labour market than men. Do I want to give all my time and energy to a company um, who, lit who don't care for me? Because at any day, I could have been one of those people they, they cut off. Do I want to dedicate all my time and mental health to this uh, job? Sara Shahid not alone in saying the pandemic left her burnt out. Women across Canada say working from home and parenting is simply exhausting. They condition a lot of women to feel like we need to perform and give everything at the expense of ourselves. And I think, you know, there's, there's a price to be paid for that. And there comes a certain point in life where you just can't do it anymore. Like, it's not sustainable. A study by RBC found that 100,000 working-age Canadian women have left the labour market entirely, meaning they're not looking for a new job. That's 10 times the number of Canadian men who have left. Women have disappeared from the labour market in the pandemic. This should, you know, we should be learning from it. It should cause alarm and we should better understand who they are, what sectors, do they plan on coming back or what would have to be true for them to come back. Bednar says women-dominated fields like nursing and teaching are already feeling the strain. And there's a stark difference between the women leaving for more fulfilling jobs and those pushed out because of a lack of childcare. Exits that are, that are kind of forced exits, right? People feeling that they can't either, that they, you know, maybe don't want to or cannot um, keep up their professional obligations given their obligations in the home. More research needed, Bednar says, to find out when and how so many Canadian women might come back to work. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Michelle, thank you so much for that story. Well, winter is on its way, and with all that is happening in the weather this year, one wonders if we'll get a lot of snow. Back in 1996, there was a blizzard hitting our city, and it hit in the night with very little warning, leaving thousands of unsuspecting British Columbians either scrambling for shovels or praying for warmer weather. Just watch. For once, southwestern British Columbia experienced a real Canadian winter when a record-breaking storm buried Vancouver Island and the entire Lower Mainland. You know it's bad when the snowplow gets stuck, but it was that kind of day. Hundreds of motorists were stranded on the Trans-Canada Highway east of Vancouver. In eight years of driving tow truck, this is the worst I've ever seen it. I was born here too, and I'm sure not used to this. I think I'll go back to Toronto for the winter. In Victoria, the roof of an apartment collapsed under an amazing 65 centimeters of snow. The people evacuated their apartment because the roof is like right in. You can see the daylight and all. I was here for the last big one. This one is way worse. Well, we have several more upstream on the way for the next several days. All of this is happening because of a massive system of Arctic air colliding with moist Pacific air. At the height of the storm, all of Vancouver, here under the red blob on the screen, was invisible to radar. The 24-hour snowfall in both Vancouver and Victoria was the heaviest since records were first kept in 1937. Very unusual. We, we see snow pretty much every year in Vancouver, this much almost never. And of course, the records uh, tell that story. Passengers at Vancouver's spanking new airport had plenty of time to admire it. Most of them went nowhere as the de-icing crews tried and failed to keep up. The unfortunate thing is with the rate of the snowfall coming down, they haven't been able to uh, they get one side of the plane cleaned and the other side's uh, already getting snowy again. Where were you going? We were going to downtown Florida. <laughs> Fort and Florida. where are you going? Downtown Vancouver. That's if he can get there. Downtown Vancouver looked like a city with not nearly enough snow plows. If you had cross-country skis, it wasn't so bad. A rare chance to have Stanley Park almost to yourself. But tonight, if you're stuck on the Trans-Canada in Arctic conditions with blowing snow, it's a nightmare. This was only the seventh white Christmas on record in Vancouver. And in the end, it turned out a little too white. Now, bear in mind that all of this was on a Sunday with very few people trying to get to work, and tomorrow may be even worse. We've already had 35 centimeters of snow here in Vancouver in 24 hours, and the forecast, believe it or not, is for freezing rain. 
When we bring you stories here at CBC Vancouver, we have award-winning photographers out capturing the images that say so much. Still images add context and bring a lot more to the understanding of an event or an issue. Here are some of the latest from what was happening this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, bye-bye. Have a good week.